classes, crazy roommates, um, parents who don't get you, um, who don't understand why you do what you do, um, professors who give you a hard time. How uh, many of you guys have professors like that? They just have no mercy at all. Um, they don't believe in mercy or grace. You fail, you fail, you take, it, take the class over. Um, but even in the midst of all of that, my God is faithful, God is true. We said it last week that in the midst of everything changing, um, semesters change, they come and go. People change, they come and go. Roommates, they change, they come and go. Where you live, they change, they come and go. But God is always the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you can always build your life, build your hope, build your trust on Him because He would never, ever, ever, ever change, man. Um, and because of that, that is why you're here tonight. You know, like in, in, in the midst of everything that you've been through thus far this semester, um, maybe you had a crazy day, maybe you had a crazy week so far, um, but, but God's grace is proven upon your life because you're being able to be here tonight um, and cast your cares upon him. So we bless God to be able to see you guys um, tonight. Uh, we're going to be picking right back up and we're going to talk, we talk about last week, we talked about vision and uh, we talked about how important it is for every person here to have a vision. The Bible says that, the book of Proverbs, that without a vision, people perish. In other words, that without any concrete direction, without any sense of understanding of your life and understanding why it is you're here, uh, why you're at ODU, if there is no true and proper revelation, uh, then really your life is, is, is pretty much prone to self-destruct at some point. Uh, but God has ordained you to be here tonight, uh, not just for you, but for you to also hear this message, uh, for you to be able to share this message with somebody else. My prayer is that uh, before this semester is done, that, that we would have reached uh, a vast amount of people on this campus uh, with, with the Word of God and with your life, your testimony. Your life is your biggest witness, um, more important than any word that will ever come out your mouth. You can say that you love people, but if you cuss them out, that kind of contradicts that. Um, you can say that you're patient, but if you count to one and just go off, that's not enough. Uh, <laughs> but your life is your greatest witness. It is your greatest example. Do not downplay the importance and significance of your life, uh, which Jesus calls your light. That is your greatest asset um, that God gives you to be able to win people over. You can try to preach to people. You can go bang people over the head with the Bible. You can stand in front of the Web Center with a picket sign saying John 3, 16, repent for the kingdom of God's near. Um, you can do all that type of stuff. That type of stuff doesn't really win people over. Um, people want to see authenticity. People want to see genuine living in reality. Uh, they want to see how you act and how you respond when you get a D plus, even in your study. Like they want to see how you're going to respond to people when they have negative things to say about you, when they begin to gossip about you. They want to see how you're going to respond uh, when things get tough in your life. And it's in those moments where God gets the greatest glory. Not downplay that. They want to see how you are when you lose in a video game. Like, y'all laughing. But some of us in here struggle with that joint. Like, you lose, you're ready to kick a TV and break a controller, you know what I'm saying? And we're not paid for it, you know, it's like, like, like these moments, uh, you know, these, these, these opportunities are, are times where God really gets the most glory. Um, it's not when you come to Bible study, like, not, not at all. Like, this is where you come to get equipped to be able to go out and serve uh, all throughout the campus, all in your dorm, your apartment, wherever you may live. Um, that's where, that's where the brother really gets the glory. Say. So all that starts with, with a vision, having an understanding for your life, an understanding God's vision, God's design, God's purpose for your life. Every person here tonight, you have a purpose, you have a calling, which we'll talk about. You have um, a reason why God has created you. If he had no purpose in creating you, you would have not been created in the first place. The Bible says in Jeremiah 1, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. It simply means that he had a plan for you well before your parents even planned you. Like, there was a path that he had set up for your life. Uh, some of us may be thinking, well, that's not cool. That's like, that bumps free will. No, it doesn't bump free will because you still can choose what you want to do. And if you choose the opposite, your life is going to suck tremendously. Um, but if you choose his plan, uh, his plan is the best. He says this word, that plans to prosper you and not harm you. plans to be you in the future. Free future. If you choose God's plan, it's the best. Choose your plan, it will suck. It's that simple. Simple math. God is good. Yours is terrible. The world is terrible. Society is terrible. Some of you guys can testify this because you try to do things on your own. What did that get you? Nowhere. It blew up in your face. 
It left you frustrated. It left you upset. You tried to date people without a standard of God, and look where it got you. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you chose a major and you weren't really spirit led with the whole thing. Look where it got you. You know? Like, God's plan is the best plan. His vision is the best thing, which is what we're going to kind of talk about tonight. So, Acts chapter 9, um, beginning at verse 10, is where we're going to uh, kind of come from tonight. Acts, Acts 9, uh, beginning at verse 10, ending at verse 17 is uh, where we're going to come from tonight. And tonight, if you're taking notes, um, tonight, if I had to kind of give tonight a, a subject, it would be driven by vision. Um, your life is to be driven by vision. Not by anything else. Not by impulses. Not by desires. Not by lust. Not by arrogance. Not by what your parents want. Not by what you want. What your boo wants. What your family wants. Whatever it is to be. Like, your life is to be driven ultimately by the vision of God. Acts chapter 9. And we're just going to read just a few verses, um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the whole entire, not the whole entire chapter, but from verses 1 to 27, I'm going to kind of summarize it, or 1 to 19, rather, and kind of summarize a little bit about what's going on here in Acts chapter 9. Um, but right before we do that, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this time of preaching and teaching, God. We pray that your word would stir up the gifts on the inside of us, God, that would, it would fan into flame, Lord, the desires that you have for our lives, Lord. We pray. Um, in Jesus' name, that you would make this thing clear, practical, powerful, Lord God. Allow us to be able to take it back, not only for us, but for our roommates who are at home chilling right now. For our professors who will be waiting in class for us tomorrow, if we go. For our friends, Lord God, wherever they may be, we pray in Jesus' name that this word, Lord God, will take root in us, but that it will also become a seed for somebody else. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 9, uh, beginning at verse 10, this is what it says. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on straight street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Verse 17, then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, immediately something like scales fell from, the sauce, from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Verse 10 says this, In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. If I say vision. vision. Driven by vision. Most people, when you ask them where they're going, they'll tell you a list of things. Where they're going in life, they'll, they'll begin to run off goals. Where do you see your life years from now? Or where are you heading in life? People will say, I want to graduate in two years. I want to work a full-time job. I want to be getting paid six figures. I'm trying to live the American dream. I want to have a nice house, white picket fence, two and a half kids. I want to have three or four cars, like a six-car garage. I want to have that. I want to have a basketball court in the backyard. I want to live like the husbands of Hollywood, per se. I want to have that life, if you will. People will run off like all of these different goals all of these different dreams and aspirations. And while there's nothing wrong with having these different achievement tread marks or better yet checkpoints, there's nothing wrong with having specific things like this. Um, that is not vision. That is the fruit of vision. That's the byproduct of vision. You graduating is not necessarily like vision. Not at all. Vision is what God has for your life and now it encompasses all of these particular things right here. If vision is just limited to temporal type things, then what happens now when you receive them, you have no vision for your life. And now you think that there's no reason for you to ever live again. Whatever you focus on, at some point you embody, you become. Whatever you begin to set your heart on, whatever you, whatever you begin to set your attention on and set your mindset on, ultimately that is what you will become. And so if you focus so much on becoming a particular person or an individual, at some point, you would try to be that person. Kobe Bryant has been listed 
years for trying to be like Michael Jordan. Because all he did was watch Michael Jordan. So he walks like Jordan. He chews his gum like Jordan. His swag is like Jordan. Uh, I was about to say something wreck, but I'm not going to say that. Uh, uh, he shoots a fadeaway jumper like Jordan. Uh, he semi-pokes his tongue out, but he doesn't want to do that because he doesn't want people to know that he got that from Jordan. You know what I'm saying? Like, whatever you ultimately expose yourself to the most is what you ultimately become. Whatever you set in front of you, whatever now becomes the driving factor for your life, whatever vision it is, that is ultimately what you will become. Hence the reason why the writer of Hebrews says in, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 and 1, he says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Because the idea and the principle is that if I focus on Jesus, I will begin to look more like Christ in everything that I do. What's the principle? The principle is this, that if I focus on a particular thing long enough, eventually I shape my life around it. My life begins to reflect it. So if I want to be that person who makes a boatload of money, my life will begin to resent that or reflect that. And unfortunately, there will be a whole lot of costs that are associated with it. Because ultimately, with any vision, there's always going to be a cost. There's going to be some sacrifices that have to be made. But the question you have to ask yourself is, whether or not the vision that I'm trying to attain, whether it's from God or not, we haven't got to that part, but whether or not the vision that I have and trying to attain, is it really worth sacrificing a lot for? Like, is it really worth putting on the altar my life? Like, does it really make sense for me to sacrifice my relationship with the Lord on the altar of a relationship with a person? Does it really get me any further in life? Does it really do anything for me? Like, what is a career really going to do for you other than make you rich? Think about it. Like, how will this really give you peace of mind? How will this really bring satisfaction? It will never bring satisfaction because you're always trying to acquire more wealth. So you work hard to get it, but then you work twice as hard, three times as hard to try to keep it. You stress yourself out. The vision that you have for your life right now, before you even get to God's vision for your life, but the vision that you have right now for your life, is it something that is really going to have some long-term residual impact in your life? When you wake up in the morning, what is it that drives you? What drives you to really get up out of bed in the morning? Is it because I just don't want to miss class because I'm going to fail? Is it because I don't want people to think that I'm lazy? Is it simply because I don't want to waste my parents' money? What is it that really drives you to get out of bed? What is it that really pushes you to go the extra mile? What is that passion? What is the thing that's burning on the inside of you, the thing that you constantly think about day and night? What is the thing that's constantly, honey, haunting you? What are your goals? Is it your goals that drive you? Is it your beliefs that drive you? Is it your dreams that drive you? Ultimately, where the danger is, Whatever you're driven by has the opportunity, if it is not true vision, to deceive you. Jesus says it like this. What is it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose or forfeit his soul? What is he saying there? He's saying it is possible that you can attain everything that life has to offer but have no life at all. It is possible to be that person on the cover of Time Magazine years from now, that person who started the business. It, it is possible for you to be somebody like a Donald Trump. It is possible for you to be somebody like an Eva Longoria who's just popular for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> it, is popular, it, it, is, it is possible for you to be popular like a lot of people that you see in mainstream media. It is possible for you to retire about 29 because you're just on the grind. But, at what cost? Did it cost you? Did it cost you your life? Did it cost you peace of mind? Did it cost you relationships? Did it cause you to have to step outside of who you are? Did it cause you to compromise who you are? This is what happens when we really begin to analyze vision. Because ultimately, if I'm driven by something that's not really rooted in God, when I accomplish it, accomplish it I can ultimately feel like I have nothing else to live for. Or I can become complacent and comfortable thinking that I've arrived and so I have nothing else to work for. Now I feel as if I have no sense of direction for my life. Or the flip side is I don't accomplish it, but I fail at it. 
I bombed it, and now I think that I have no hope. I can never be successful. See, this world is a very, very, very deceitful system set up. Because what they do is they flash all of these images in front of you. Lose this amount of weight in this particular day. I heard an ad on a commercial on the radio yesterday where it said, uh, do you want to lose 30 pounds in a week? I was like, what? I don't even know if that's healthy. <laughs> And it was some commercial for taking a pill. What if you could lose 10 pounds a day? That's not even healthy. Dude. Like, I don't know what you're doing. Like, that's not, that's, that's some counterfeit stuff. You might die after day five. <laughs> for real. Because of what your body's going to be doing. So the world flashes all of these images of what you can be and what you can attain. But the problem is the world is not telling you what it's going to cost you. That's the fine print. Like, it's, it's funny because like TV commercials, especially like for cars and vehicles, they're like, they're notorious for this. They flash in big bold letters, the great deal for that car, $60,000 car, you can only have a monthly payment of $200. What? No. Impossible. But then, beneath all that, the stuff that's, that you've got to pause your DVR to look at, <laughs> that's where it tells you how. That's the clause. But the world doesn't tell you the cost. The cost, not at all. The world doesn't tell you the cost. Nah. All the world advertises is the pleasure in it. Picture yourself driving in a new Avalon. Picture yourself driving the 7 Series Beamer. Picture yourself in that brand new Volvo truck. And they flash all of these things. Then they have like things like dating websites. It's crazy. So they flash all of these things. Like they're real, they, they kind of spruce it up now even in the kingdom. Christian mingle in. <laughs> Find God's match for you. <laughs> uh, all of that. eHarmony.com. Like there's so many different things that the world presents. These are images. One word for image is simply a vision. They present all these different visions before you. And if you're not careful, if you're not moving down, legitimately, you will fall for it. Get rich quick schemes. They, they thrive off of impulse decisions. Because what they do is they tell you, how would you like to retire by 32? Your college loans right now, you're going to have loans of 30, 40, 50,000 dollars when you get out. How would you like to have that paid off by 24? Hmm. Automatically, your eyes are going to perk up. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, I'm trying to get this thing paid off quick, man. Because this interest is about to kick in. When I, once I walk past that stage, interest is in there. I'm trying to get it out and done. So they, they flash all of these things to visions, images. But what they don't tell you is what it's going to cost you. I have had throughout like my years, I don't know about you guys, but like I've had so many get rich quick schemes come my way. It's ridiculous. And all, here's the crazy thing. All of it sounds good. Like, like if you don't know anybody, like, yo, this is make it work. Like, I can be paid. Right? Like, most of them thrive off of getting other people to sign up under you. But here's, like, what's so crazy. Like, you're, you're probably going to sign up your friends who are going to sign up their friends, but the problem is all y'all know each other. So you're only going to make only a little bit of money from work for it because you're making money off each other. Mm -hmm. Your circle's not that big. They don't tell you that, though. They just tell you, yo, you, you can be a millionaire. $100,000 paycheck coming in your way every month. How would you like to have that? I would love to have that. Like, I'm serious. I would love to have a thousand dollar paycheck coming to my mailbox every month. Now I have to work. That would be great. Sit, watch sports center. That would be awesome. Play basketball, play golf, whatever. I would love that. Chill. Sleep at 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> like, I have no hours. I have no sleep no structure in my life, no vision in my life. Because I don't even have money. Nah, man. It's not worth it. Not worth it at all. That's what the world thrives off of. If what I'm driven by is not rooted in Christ, then at some point I will hit a brick wall. You will reach a climax. And I'm not talking about what Usher was talking about. Not at all. <laughs> See, why y'all know about that? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, what? No. You will hit a brick wall if you are not rooted in Christ. At some point, what you're trying to attain, what you're working for, at some point it will run out. It will be done. Because nothing in this life is that permanent. Not at all. Nothing in this life is worth dying for except Christ.
because he died for you. Nothing at all. But the world doesn't thrive on that. But this is ultimately why God desires that we obtain true vision that only comes from him. We talked about that last week in our story with Mark chapter 8, the blind man. Jesus was the only one who could give that man vision. God is the only one who can give you true, proper vision for your life. You can try to find it in a self-help book. You can go to advising performance and try to get vision. You can sit up in your house. You can watch this TV show and this TV show. You can watch Steve Harvey. You can watch Oprah. You can watch all of these different sitcoms to try to get an idea as to where you want your life to go. But ultimately, if it does not come from God, then all you have is not a vision, but a hallucination. Which simply means it'll be here one day with God next. Vision is eternal. Vision outlasts you because it wasn't you who came up with it. Vision, because it comes from God, has to be eternal. So it lives well after you're gone. How do we know this to be true? You're the church. The church is not a building. You're the church. You're body believers. We're still talking about the church 2,000 plus years later. The thing that Jesus talked about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Pontius why I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And we're still here 2,000 plus years later. What's that called? Vision. Because that did not come from any old man. That came from God himself. And when you and I begin to function and thrive in vision and ultimately begin to submit ourselves to that, now we set ourselves up for the greatest satisfaction that we could ever experience. So you may be thinking, like, what does this have to do with this particular text? It has everything to do with this text. Because in the text, ultimately, there's a story about this guy by the name of Saul. We know him as the Apostle Paul, who wrote a good portion of the New Testament. But here, in the early part of Acts chapter 9, it talks about his transformation experience. It talks about how he was on his way to some synagogues, which is pretty much a fancy word for a church, in a place called Damascus. He was going to Damascus to persecute Christians prior to him coming to Christ and knowing that Christ is Lord and Savior. He hated Christians. He despised Christians. He despised believers. If we were in Paul's time and he found that when we were meeting right now, he would try to get a warrant to come arrest all of us so that way we could be beheaded at some point. That's how real it was. Matter of fact, that's how it really still is in some countries all around this world. We just don't see it because we're in the land of the free. <laughs> home of the brave. But some other countries, like Iran, Iraq, where they preach the gospel, people are on death row experiencing some of the same things that a guy like Paul was inflicting upon them. So as Paul is on his way to do his dirt, to persecute the church, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he gets knocked off his horse, as the old church would say. And he has this crazy, revelatory experience like he's never experienced before. The Bible says that it was this big, flashing, tight light. A light from heaven flashed around him in verse, verse 3. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? He asked. He says, I'm the one that you persecuted. I'm Jesus Christ. He said, I have strict instructions for you. I want you to go down to Damascus. Isn't it interesting how in the midst of Paul being on the way to do his grimy dirt opposing the will of God, God met him and stopped him in his tracks. Maybe that doesn't have any significance for you, but when you think about your own life, think about what you were on your way to doing before you came to know Christ. Think about how wrecked your life was. Before God knocked you off your horse. Think about who you were with, where you were. Think about who you were grinding up on. Think about whose bed you were in. Think about the lies that you were telling, the deceit that you and I were engaged in. We were literally on our way to wrecking our lives. But Jesus stopped us in our tracks before we ultimately went all the way with it. I don't know about you, man. That is exciting. To know that he knows exactly where to meet me. That right before I'm ready to drive the car of my life off the cliff, he stops me. My tire blows out sometimes. That's what he did. That's what he did. Ultimately, as you and I, before you may have came to know Christ, if you know Christ, but before you came to that place, you were on your way. I promise you, if we were to sit here and talk to every person here, talk to you here, talk to me here, we would share different experiences as it relates to what your life looked like prior to you coming to know Christ. And you would probably have a similar story like Saul here. He has a conversion with the Lord about his lifestyle, how he's been opposing God. Living without true vision leads to a reckless life. Why? Because you have no solid direction for your life. You have no clue. You don't have a clue what you do. You think you do, but you don't have a clue. Not at all. So what God does is he comes and he blows the whole thing up. He's like, yo, this plan right here, this is whack. You thought this was a plan? Please. <laughs> this thing was going to wreck and kill you. And you were just so drunk off of the possibility <clears throat> of success that you didn't see it. 
You were so drunk off of the possibility that you could get rich that you were blinded by the enemy. Similar to like Paul, he was blinded. He couldn't see. He didn't really see where his life was headed. All he saw was the next person to kill. That's how some of us were. All we saw was the next party. Put the next webcam. What the next house party? I know it's going to get shut down by 11.30, even though it started at 11.15, but I just want to go school. <laughs> like, for real. What the next thing going out? Like, we're just thinking, like, business as usual. But God loves you and cares about you too much to let you live life business as usual. That's a boring life. That's a whack life, man. You know, like, I'll be transparent. Like, like I got over the idea of parties quick. Because parties were the same. I was like, this is a boring life. You guys play the same music. It's the same people, unless you just go to somebody else's university. <coughs> they got the same drinks. You're going to get the same drink every time you go to a different party. <laughs> like, it's the same stuff. It's whack. It sucks. If that's life, that sucks. Some of you guys have probably heard, before you came to college, maybe even while you're in college, enjoy your years in college. These will be the best years you will ever have. How many of you guys have heard that? That is the biggest lie <laughs> anybody can ever tell. Because what I've come to find out is that when you're in Christ, college is just a preview of what God is going to do for the rest of your life. The Bible talks about how every day he gives new mercies. So that means college years can't be the best years. They're good now. They may, the best, they may be the best that I've ever experienced thus far. But it doesn't stop here. Not at all. But a person who doesn't have true vision, it's easy to believe that lie. That man, like, once I get out of college, man, I'm just going to be working. I might get married. I might have some kids. Like, man, I look at my parents. My parents just whack. They terrible, man. They go to bed at 7 o'clock. Right? That's whack. I ain't trying to do that. I'm not trying to progress. I'm not trying to grow. That's a person who doesn't have vision. Where there's no vision, people perish. Perishing takes place over time. It's a gradual dying process. Not like, like you just die instantaneously, but it's a constant withering away. But God says when you walk in the vision that I have for your life, ultimately it leads to a blessed life. But here's what's crazy. In this vision, he tells Paul to go into the city, the city that he was actually going to do his dirt and kill a few Christians. And he says, go into the city. I've given you new instructions. I've given you some direction for your life. He tells him to go into the city and from there, he will be instructed in what to do. And while most people preach this text and teach this text all about Paul, I don't want to do that tonight. I want to talk about Ananias. I want to talk about somebody who was driven by vision, not just Paul. Like, like Paul gets the, the Christian of the Forever Award. <laughs> because he wrote 13 books of the Bible. And, and, and he was integral in starting a lot of churches. And, and granted, he is huge in the Bible. But God didn't just work through Paul. God also worked with Ananias. Matter of fact, if there was no Ananias, Paul wouldn't even be here. If there was no Ananias to lay hands on Paul, the scales from Paul's eyes never actually come off, which means Paul never really gained true insight and true direction for his life. That's what I'm talking about now. I'm talking about Ananias. Ananias is interesting because as God spoke to Paul, it's interesting that God spoke not only to Paul, but at the same time as he was speaking to Paul, he also speaks to Ananias. Verse 10, that's what he says. He says, God appeared to Ananias in a vision. He said, Ananias, call my name. What does it say to me? God can be speaking to you, and he's also speaking to the person next to you at the same time. Like, God is not a compartmentalized type dude where he can only talk to one person at a time. That's your advisor. They can only meet with you one day at a time. And their schedule is never conducive for your schedule. Not at all. True, yes. God is always available. And he's always speaking. So just as God was speaking to Paul, he was also speaking to Ananias at the same exact time. Just as much as this story is about the vision God gave Paul, it has everything to do with the vision that God gave Ananias. Now it's interesting because Ananias was a follower of Christ. Ananias wasn't just some regular old dude. The Bible says that here that he was a disciple. And it's interesting because as you see Ananias' life and as you also see Paul's life, you see two different types of visions here. When God gives visions, it's usually for one or two reasons. Number one, it's for warning and redirection. That's what Paul experienced. So God speaks to warn you, dude, you're going in the wrong direction. You need to get it together. It's time for you to stop following me. 
You're no longer the captain of your own boat. You're about to die. You're about to shipwreck your own life. It's time for you to come follow me. The second reason he may give vision, or the second way he may give vision, is for confirmation and affirmation. That's what he did with Ananias. Ananias wasn't being disobedient to what God wanted him to do. The Bible says he was a disciple. He was a follower of Christ, which means he was in place. And so when God spoke, all it did was confirm what he was already hearing. Walking with God. How can you tell this? Look at the two responses. Look at what Paul says in verse 5. Paul says, who are you, Lord? What does that represent? No relationship. No connection to God. But look at Ananias' response in verse 10. What does he say? Yes, Lord. He knew the Lord was speaking to him. So, how do we put this in context for you as a student, you as a young adult, wherever you are right now in life? God is always speaking. He's always speaking to your roommate, who you think is just the worst drunk in history. He's always speaking to your parents, who you just think are crazy in their head. He's always speaking to them. What your role in your life is to do, because you know that God is speaking, is to help them understand that it is God speaking to them. That when crazy events happen to them, this is not coincidence, though. This is God speaking. That maybe the reason you keep getting in situations like this is not because it's by happenstance, but no, God's trying to get your attention. Like the reason why God places you in other people's lives who can't see is because you can see. And he wants you to help them to be able to see. That was the assignment that God had for Ananias. Ananias could see he had a vision. Paul had no clue. The dude didn't have a clue what he was doing at all. It took Ananias to come and to redirect him. So that's what I'm going to focus on for these next few moments. In particular, with Ananias, we learned a few principles about, about vision. Three main principles I want to focus on. Number one, when, when God gives a vision, it is always clear. Tell the person beside you, say it's clear. When you look at verse 11, verse 11 says, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. That's not Judas Iscariot, he's dead by now. Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him. To restore his sight. Then you go down to verse 15. Verse 15 says this. Go. This man is my chosen servant. Chosen instrument. This is what God has sent to Ananias. To proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings. And to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Notice how specific God is in this vision. There is no misunderstanding about what God is saying. Like Ananias is trying to figure out. Okay God. Like where you want me to go? Like Damascus, Judea? No. Damascus. You want, when do you want me to go? Now! <laughs> what do you want me to do? Lay hands on them. Like, there's specific, clear details. When God gives you vision, it's always clear. Always clear. Like, like people wrestle, I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life, and I just don't know what the Lord is leading me to do. One of two things are happening in your life. Number one, either you're not spending enough time with God to understand the clarity of the vision. Or number two, it wasn't really God who gave you the vision in the first place. Vision is clear. If you spend time with God, it becomes clear if it's not already. And as you're spending time with God, if that vision never really comes clear, then that means that that wasn't something that God came up with. That was your idea, which was probably under the influence of the enemy. But we're not going to talk about that now. That's a whole other thing. So if somehow things aren't connecting in your head, things ain't making sense, the question you got to ask God, is this the vision that you've given me? Because where you give vision, things are clear. Isaiah 54, 11 says this, So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. God's word is clear, and it will always come to pass. If you are confused right now about what your life is supposed to be like, if you're confused about where you're supposed to be after graduation, if you have no clue what it is you're supposed to do next year, if you have no clue why you're where you are, why you're even at Old Dominion University four years later, if you have no idea, where you are right now in life, spend time with God. Ask God to open up your eyes. Ask God to make the vision clear. And maybe that involves turning down things in your life so you can properly hear Him and taking things out of your line of sight so you can properly see Him. Vision is always clear. If the vision I think is from God is not clear, as I said, it either means that God didn't give it or it means I need to go back to Him and gain proper clarity. The one thing I also love about vision, this is how you know it's true vision. Because true vision always connects with other visions that God gives other people. Matter of fact, that's like confirmation. If, if You probably heard that word. Confirmation. 
Like people use that terminology to describe like when they're thinking that God has said something and then all of a sudden something just pops up and, and it correlates with what God said to them. You know, oh, that's confirmation. It's confirmation like love. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm praying, you know what I'm saying, that the Lakers will turn things around and then we beat the Oklahoma City on Sunday. Oh, that's confirmation like love. <laughs> I mean, I don't think that's confirmation. Because <laughs> you definitely get blown out the next game. Uh, but nonetheless, the point is this, that when God speaks, always gives clear direction and clear confirmation. How do we know this to be true? Because look what happened in verse 11 and verse 12. The Bible says this. It says, in a vision, in a vision, God spoke to a man named Saul. And what God spoke to Saul, he also spoke to Ananias. There is a connection here. Vision is connected. So what this means is if God truly has spoken something to you, and you may be connected to some people who hear God as well. If what God has said to you is true, and it's from God, and you're sharing this with other people who believe in God and who have vision from God, then what you're saying should not be foreign to them. It should be like, oh, you know what? I've seen that too. That makes sense. But if you're around some people right now who don't have no vision, then you need to get rid of them. Throw them off the boat, like Jonah got thrown off the boat. There's obedience. It's a whole other message. You gotta ask yourself the question right now. What is the vision that God has in my life? Like for real. Are things really clear in your life? Like be transparent with yourself right now. Are things really clear with your life? I think a lot of times the mistakes that a lot of people make to come to college is like, like I just come, I take however long it takes me to graduate, get my degree, and after that, I don't know what I'm gonna do with the rest of my life. Not at all. People come up with these cookie cutter responses. How do you know that 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 and, I, and once again I'm not trying to I'm not trying to bash like ideas or I'm trying to have a good job or have a good career. But if everybody's response is the same, come to college, get a degree, get paid. That's a cookie cutter vision. Like, you don't have to be saved to have that vision. So that can't be true vision. That's a goal. Vision is particular to what God has created you and destined you to do. Your vision should be different than the person that's sitting next to you. If the person sitting next to you has the same vision, then you, you probably, y'all, I have to ask a question, did you really hear from God? Is that a goal? Like, yeah, I want to graduate too. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, that's cool. We should. Definitely. Press towards the mark, yeah. <laughs> but what's the vision for your life? Like, what happens after college? What happens when you turn 30? What is the ministry that God's called you to? The gifts that he's placed inside of you, like, what, why has he given you these gifts? What are you doing with the gifts that he's given you? Like, that, there, I promise you, if there was a spiritual formation class here offered at ODU, you probably would not have nearly as much recklessness as you do. Like, if there was a class where people just really did some serious unpacking of people's lives, they had this class, like I said, just said in, in seminary called spiritual formation. In my seminary class, we had this class, and this class really caused you to have to wrestle with some things. My, uh, my, my uh, professor in spiritual formation, she said, I want you guys to do one thing. You guys probably think it's real simple. I want you to write a vision statement for your life. And that's only be one sentence. Oh, okay, that's cool. First time I wrote, wrote that joint, she marked it up and gave it back to me. It's not a vision. It's an idea. <laughs> this is a checkpoint. It's not a vision. My vision, I want to be successful in life. Who does it? <laughs> it's not a vision. Does that make you unique from the person that you're sitting next to? I want to be a missionary for the Lord and go into other countries and spread the gospel. Now we're talking. I want to be somebody on campus now who leads people to Christ. Now we're talking. Because this is not something that everybody this is what now separates you. I want to be able to bless people on campus as I'm a student in this season of my life. I just want to be able to cook for people who don't have any food on campus. I get access every month. I get extra groceries. Why not make some extra chicken wings for somebody? Why not I swipe my car extra for somebody? I ain't going to eat it no way. Now we talk about vision. Because now, ultimately, your life is now coming in contact with the vision of God. Here's the second thing. Vision is not only clear. This is my favorite point. It's probably going to upset you. Vision 
is also conflicting. <laughs> it's conflicting. What do I mean by that? When you look at verse 13, after God speaks to Ananias, notice what Ananias' response is. God says, Ananias, dude, I want you to go lay hands on Paul. He's going to have uh, skills and all this type of stuff. Um, I've anointed him. I've gifted him to be able to serve, to lead people, to preach to the Gentiles, to preach to the Jews, all this good stuff. I want you to go help his brother see. What does what, what Ananias say? Lord, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. In other words, what is Ananias saying? Lord, are you sure about this? This doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You want me to go lay hands and pray for, help see, this dude didn't say lie, help see a dude who was on an assignment to come kill me and anybody else who professed in Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. You want me to help him? Are you sure? Like, are we, so, are, are we talking about the same dude here? This dude doesn't have a perfect resume. Lord, you do know that he does not like the church. Are you sure? What, what does this mean for you? Real vision causes tension, whether it be in your life or in somebody else's life. In other words, when God calls you to something or when God gives you a vision for something, it will not always make sense. Not only to you, but also to people around you. So, some of you guys right here, you got a vision. God says, listen, I want to do something through you that I've never done in anybody else in your family. So, maybe it is graduating from college. Your family's like, what? Go to college? You better work. You got bills to pay. You gotta eat. Man, don't work, you gotta eat. <laughs> I wanna stay pure until I'm married. Please. What? No. So the votes. Get it in now. Get it in with as many, with as many people as you can. Because once you get married, you only have one person. <laughs> And you're going to get tired of them after a while. Y'all going to get upset. Y'all going to have arguments. And then, no. Vision always causes conflict. When you look all throughout the course of the Bible, there are plenty of people who had vision birthed on the inside of them. And when they begin to operate in that vision, it was conflict. Nehemiah is a perfect example. Read the book of Nehemiah. I love that book. When you read, when you read the first few chapters of Nehemiah, Nehemiah, he was a cupbearer to the king, but when he heard about his hometown, Jerusalem, being just absolutely destroyed and annihilated, the walls that protected the city were destroyed, the gates were burned down by fire, he caught wind of it, his heart was burdened, he cried out to God, he, he asked God for forgiveness on behalf of himself and then also for his people in Jerusalem, and he was birthed with the vision to go rebuild the wall, to restore the standard and the glory of the Lord to the people in Jerusalem. Everybody was cool with it. That was in his Nehemiah's camp. But then you have two guys by the name of Sambala and Tobias. And the Bible says in about verses 1 through 3 in chapter 4, it says, When Sambala heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry. Vision exposes things, man. Vision really shows the condition of your heart and the condition of other people's hearts. Do not expect the vision that God has given you to ultimately be accepted by everyone around you. That's why he's called you to it. Definitely. I'll be transparent. I professed my call to preach 19 years old. People in my family thought I was stupid. <laughs> what? You can preach, but you, you go to school. Preach? You said you call a pastor? Sweet, man. That ain't a real job. Nothing. Not at all. People thought it was crazy, man. People thought, some people thought, and he was crazy, some people thought it was like, oh, so cute, that's cute. <laughs> but there's nothing cute about this. Like, like, if I don't preach, you will die and sit. What's <laughs> cute about that? You know what I'm saying? Like, you want to be cute and burn to death? Is that what you want to do? Is that what you want? I mean, I can just be silent, you know what I mean? I don't say that at all. And people thought I was crazy. It's like, yeah, I just, man, come on, let's be real. Preacher, dude, come on. You're strong, man. You're strong. You're an engineer. Go to school. Get paid, man. Get an engineering degree. Go work. You feel the call to ministry? What? And I'm not talking about like some rickety people that, that I just knew on campus. You know what I'm saying? Like just a Facebook associates. <laughs> but you're talking about people that was close. Parents not even understanding. Yeah, I think I'm called to ministry, man. Like, for real, I think, I think God's really burned me, burned me with this thing. 
I know it's not me because I wouldn't want to do it wrong. Okay, that's cool, you know, but you, you still need to get a job. Like, get a real job. Like, a real job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't do that, man. That'd be disobedient. That's not the vision that God's People don't understand it. Years later. Oh. <laughs> Lord really did know what he's doing. Yes! I'm trying to tell y'all. <laughs> but y'all didn't see that because you didn't have vision for your own life. When other people have vision, as we talked about earlier, it connects with the vision that God has placed in your life. So now I hear Pastor say something like, yo, I'm called to preach. And they're like 15, 16, I got kids in my own church. One of my kids this past summer and summer came, he's like, yeah, man, uh, we, we asked him, like, yo, what do you guys want to do? Like, what do you guys got to feel God's calling you to do? One of my oldest teenagers, he's in high school, he's about 17, 18 years old. He said, yeah, I feel God calling me to pastor. Somebody adults in there was like, please. It's like, what? Do you, you understand that it was casting a Bible leading nations at eight? Like, like y'all manage, y'all can't even manage y'all own bank account. You grown. grown. These little kids who better than going through puberty managing a nation because they're being led by vision. Do not expect the vision that God gives you to be accepted by people. God may be calling some of you guys to switch your major. That's the vision he's given. That's what caused a lot of tension. Like in people's checkbooks. They're not going to understand it. Not at all. They're going to be like, um, what are you getting your head filled with that you? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I go to this Bible study. And, you know, <laughs> so I'm coming out there. <laughs> Who that dude that preach? <laughs> How many times I'm going to hate it? Nah, it's not going to be accepted by everybody. Don't even try to explain it to people. What sense does it make to try to rationalize a vision that only you can understand, but they can't because they call them out? They're not going to understand, man, because they're not looking at through spiritual eyes. Oh, not one bit. Matter of fact, there was a guy in the Bible named by the name of Jonah. Jonah, he had this clear conviction. God called Jonah to go preach to the people of Nineveh. It conflicted with him internally. God, I'm not going to Nineveh to preach. The fool's crazy. Man, they cannibals, man. They deserve to die. God, I'm not preaching to them. Let them jokers die and burn in hell. Samuel L. Jackson style. <laughs> Some of y'all remember that movie we said that a lot. <laughs> Okay. Uh, anyway. uh, well before Avengers with the one eye. Uh old school Sam. Let them cats die, God. No, they don't need your grace and your mercy. They had their chances. So what did John do? He ran. Because there's only two responses when God gives vision. Either you run to it or you run from it. Either you accept it or you deny it. Either you embrace it or you disgrace it. It's one of two things. There is no in between. There is no gray area with this thing. I believe legitimately God has been speaking to every person in here well before we even started this vision series. Like there's some stuff that God's placed on your heart for a minute. And you've been coming up with every line, reason, and excuse and rhyme not to be able to do it. And God's like, listen, man, time's getting tight. Don't make me have to bust you upside the head to the white meat for you to understand that this is what I'm supposed to do. Why does it take me have to get? Why, why does it take a car accident for you to actually sit down and listen to my voice? How does it take that? Mm. Why does it take an STD for you to sit still long enough for you to understand what I'm calling you to do? There's a vision that God has for your life. He's been speaking it to you. Whether you're walking in it is a whole other thing. The question you have to ask now is: Now that I'm hearing this word, now that I'm hearing this message, now that I'm hearing this thing, what am I going to do with it? Which leads us to the last point, and then we're done. True vision when it comes from God is clear. True vision causes conflict, whether it be with us or whether it would be with other people. True vision, last point, is ultimately a calling. Talk about it. Verse 17, the Bible says, Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. Ananias was called by God to go to Saul. A calling. This is a biblical term for what we may know as, in this context, as a purpose. It is something that is divinely initiated by God as to why God has created you in the first place. Some of you are called to 
go in different places after you finish. Some of you are called to move to a different state. Some of you are called to stay here in a local 757 area and serve. Some of you guys may be called to a different country. Some of you guys may be called to go back home and restore things like a Nehemiah. Some of you may be called to do this, to do that. Nonetheless, there's a call on your life and God desires that you would fulfill it and properly respond to the call that's on your life. Acts chapter 26, verses 12 through 19. In verse 19, Paul says it like this. After he's gotten saved, after he's been baptized, he's standing before the Sanhedrin. And after the Sanhedrin is trying to ultimately talk him out of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, he says it like this. He says, I received this vision from God. Talking about this vision here in Acts, 9, in Acts chapter 9. He says, I received this vision, and I was not disobedient to the vision. That was from heaven. True vision is a calling from God. That's why you can't shake it. That's why you can't deny it. If you can let it go, then that means it wasn't really for you in the first place. True vision does not, you can't let go of true vision because true vision won't let go of you. So you think about it all the time. You dream about it all the time. You're in class and you think about it. When I was called to preach, man, I thought about that dream every day. I'm literally like in class times, like, I'm in the bottom here. This ain't what I'm called. Not at all. Like, like, literally thinking about this journey. Hey, night, call the ministry. I'm supposed to be doing engineering at home, planning ministry. Why is the session? We can talk about that later. <laughs> but this call is, is so huge, man. It burned you. You can't escape it. And even within this ministry, like, part of the reason why it's hard for churches and ministries to go. Grow, it's not because they lack the capacity or the resources, it's because people won't be obedient to fulfill the calling. So it's plenty of people here. God's called some of y'all to sing. God has come to y'all, called some of y'all to greet, to be on a house team. He's calling some of us fellas to get connected to men's ministry, to get connected to women's ministry. He's calling some of us, you've been gifted with a crazy amount of rhythm compared to the average person. He's calling you to step. <laughs> Like, you have a calling on your life. Do not waste four or five years just getting a piece of paper and not identify your calling. We were talking, uh, my wife and I had to preach at the church in North Carolina this past weekend. And uh, we were talking to this pastor. He started the church when he was about, about mid-30s or whatever the case may be. And he's pastoring the church for 17 years. He said he got saved when he was 30. Wow. 30 years old. And so we're down there and we just saw all the amazing things that God has done just in 17 years since the church has been in existence. And so we're just really humbled by it. And as we're sitting there, he's, he's talking, he and his wife are sharing with Ariel and I, and he says, but, man, if we would have got saved and been working in ministry around your age, it's not terrible what God would do. Mm -hmm. Now, we bless God for the fruit now, most of that. He is great. All things work for him. But we just can't wonder, we can't stop but to wonder and think, how crazy would it have been to come to know the Lord? High school, serving in ministry as a teenager, as a young adult, to the point where I don't have to go through a whole bunch of hell leading up to 30. Because now I'm functioning within the call. So, am I saying that, that if you get saved and in, in you're 80, God can't work through you? No, that's not what I'm saying. But my thing is, why wait to function in your call? Imagine if Ananias would have waited to function in his call. Paul would still be blind. If he would have contemplated, you know, I don't know about this thing. If he would have dragged his feet like we often drag our feet for trying to make a decision about something, Paul would have been out back, steakhouse. <laughs> wouldn't be able to see. We would have 13 epistles. There probably would be churches around. But Ananias moved immediately. Respond because the calling is too great for me to continue to put off. Maybe you've been putting off your calling for a long time. I don't want you to think that calling is just some grand thing and it's only limited to serving within the church or the four walls, serving in a particular ministry. No, no, no. That's not what I mean. What I'm talking about, God has a calling for your life. He may be having some specific callings. He may be calling you to reconcile with your mom. He may be calling you to reconcile with your parents, with your friends. He may be calling you to reconcile with people that you ended a relationship with in a bad way some semesters ago. He may be calling you to get rid of some things in your life, things that are stumbling blocks right now, things that are hindering you, hindering you from being able to properly function in the will of God. 
you have a calling on your life, and it is great. But it will never happen until you respond to it. And your life is not the only life that depends on it. But it's also other people's lives who depend on it as well. Last thing, Ananias, as I'm closing, this dude was called, man. Some of us think like, okay, I think I'm called to do this, but I'm nervous about it. I'm scared. Shaking with fear, trembling. No. I can't be called to preach. I don't like standing in front of people. Why? Because you're looking at it from your own strength. I get nervous. I shrink up. I shake. I sweat. I got to go to the bathroom like eight times. Some of y'all despise public speaking. Wouldn't it be something else that God calls you to preach? You know what your excuse would be? Like Moses. Lord, I can't speak. I have a stuttering issue. I'm slow of tongue. You know, it was interesting. I heard a preacher say, you know, Moses, he, though he could not talk that well, he gave plenty of opportunities to talk about his excuses. Like, Moses, you're talking real good right now. <laughs> Giving all these excuses. You ain't stuttering enough, Moses. <laughs> but you can't preach. You can't declare what thus saith the Lord to the people. No, I, I can't greet people because, no, I'm, you know, I, I just can't do it now. I'm just, I'm just too shy. I'm just shy. Oh, really? But when you're at home, you ain't like that. You ain't like that at all. <clears throat> it's a whole other person. Matter of fact, the most quiet ones be the most buck ones. I've come to learn in 27 plus years. When you think that you are not equipped, God is like, are you stupid? If I've called you to it, that means you are equipped to do it. Mm. God would never ask you to do something that he's not already equipped you for. Not at all. It all comes back to whether or not I believe he has equipped me. When God calls you to something, that means he's equipped you and empowers you. He's prepared you to be able to do it, and he's given you the authority to be able to do it. All you better do now is believe it. God makes things so easy on us, it's ridiculous. But what happens is we get so caught up in ourselves, we get so caught up with looking at ourselves that we cannot focus on what it is that God has called us to do. Ananias almost fell for that trap. He almost got distracted. But he saw clearly the vision that God had for him. Go, go. Go to Brother Saul. Lay your hands on him. I have a great work for him to do. Matter of fact, we should be grateful that God did this in Ananias' life. To lay his hands on somebody like Saul. Mm -hmm. Because what that ultimately shows is that God has a plan and purpose for every person. People that you think are wicked. Like, there's some people right now, because God has cleansed you, and he's purified you, which is awesome. Bless the Lord for it. There's certain people you just don't want to be around for. Like, you just, ugh. No. You're a sinner. No, Lord. You don't want me to talk to them. God's like, no, no, no. I need you to help them see. I need you to help them be able to see the plan that I have in their life. The vision that I have for their life. The vision I have for their life is connected to the vision I have for your life. And as you humble yourself to be able to see that, that is when your life will be filled with fulfillment and ultimate satisfaction. Let's pray, Father.